In this video, I'm going to talk about plan comparisons and the corresponding contrast weightings that need to be specified in order to conduct most plan comparisons. So in order to conduct a plan comparison, one needs to specify contrast weightings, and these contrast weightings reflect a particular directional hypothesis. So we're in the land of directional hypotheses where we might be doing a one-tailed test rather than a two-tailed test because you're specifying the direct of the effect. And just to give you a little bit of an example, and I'll talk more about this, and ultimately it really comes together once you see the examples applied with software. The example I give here is low dose versus medium dose and high dose. Let's just say those are three types of drugs like alcohol and you're measuring memory span performance, you would expect memory span to be incrementally affected more adversely as dosage increases. That's a directional hypothesis. The higher the alcohol dose, the worse your performance on a memory span test. And you can specify contrast weightings to reflect that direction of a hypothesis. Now, something I put in a textbook is to alert you to the fact that even just a regular basic independent sample t-test can be conceived in the context of a contrast analysis or a co with contrast weightings. And what we have here is mean 1 versus mean 2 divided by the standard error, the difference between two means. But what you don't really see here is that this could be expressed in the context of a contrast. And what researchers typically specify a contrast that symbolized is this symbol psi and what you can see is mean one and mean two so that is exactly what you have here mean one and mean two we have mean one and mean two however rather than subtracting one mean from the other there's actually an addition here and that's how contrasts are specified is by summing a particular function across all terms in the numerator but what's important is that each mean is associated with a weighting and in this case, the weighting is plus one. For mean two, it's negative one. And when you solve this, you ultimately get the same thing as this, mean one minus mean two. So even though we're summing, we actually have multiplication values taking place here. So mean one times plus one is mean one. And mean two times negative one turns into a negative value for mean one. And so when we add that, we find that we're just getting mean one minus mean two. Now I make the joke in the textbook that is this really just an opportunity for statisticians to complicate the lives of students and that's not really quite true. It's because contrasts, even though this one's very basic and you'd say why don't you just express it like this? Well yeah you can but this is a very basic contrast. There are many more much more complicated and much more insightful and interesting types of contrasts that can be specified for a collection of means, particularly when you have three or more means. I mentioned here that realistically there are only three types of contrasts that you might actually perform as planned comparison. This won't encompass all types, but probably 98% of all contrasts that researchers are interested in testing fall into these categories. Linear contrasts, where you're expecting a linear increase or a linear decrease in the means across a particular independent variable. You have quadratic contrasts where there is an upward or downward bend in the pattern of the means. So instead of a linear upward or a linear downward trend in the means, you can have an upward trend or a downward trend, what people call an inverted U or a U-shaped bend. So quadratic contrasts, as I write in the textbook, have only one bend in the means. The final group of contrasts that you might actually consider specifying is a combined treatments versus control group contrast. And this is not used very commonly, I would say, but it can be considered in the context of drug treatments, I would say, is where you might see it, or some kind of uh, treatment study where you don't find any significant effects based on your comparisons and then you have one last shot with a combined treatment effect. I really don't see it as much. That's why I've left it as the third group of contrasts that you might test. Certainly linear is by far the most common and quadratic is pretty common too. So how do we know what to specify as the weightings in order to represent a particular hypothesis we have in mind? 
Well, fortunately, these tables have been created so that you don't have to think about it yourself. You can simply apply based on your availability of a table, and I've made one available in the textbook. So if you have three means that you want to evaluate for a linear effect, you could specify negative one, zero for the second mean, and one for the third mean. So that is representing an upward trend in the means, because this value is lower than zero, and zero is lower than one. Basically, it's reflecting an upward trend in the means. Now you can switch it around and have a plus here, and a zero, and a negative one here, and that would be a downward trend in the means. And that would be consistent with the hypothesis that dosage of alcohol will progressively and increasingly affect memory span performance. So in that case, you would specify plus one, zero, and negative one as your linear contrast. And I mentioned in the textbook that one of the main rules that you need to follow in order to specify a contrast is that the weightings need to sum to zero. And in this case here, negative one plus zero plus plus one is zero. And that's true for all of these contrasts that I've specified here. Here's a quadratic function you could consider testing. And again, this will become more and more clear as you follow the examples I provide you in, in subsequent videos to actually evaluate these types of hypotheses. So in this case, we have a quadratic function where we start low, and then the mean goes up to two, and then it comes back down to negative one. So that's one bend in the means. And it's a inverted U-shape. Now, if we actually hypothesize a U-shaped function in the means, we would put plus one here, negative two, and plus one here. That would reflect this sort of pattern in the means, and a U-shaped pattern. Now, once you go up to four means, things get a little bit more complicated, because for a linear contrast, going from low to high, you could specify negative three, negative two, plus one, plus three. That goes from low to high. And then the quadratic, which is starting low, going high, and going back down again. So negative one, plus one, plus one, and then down again. So that would be an inverted U-shape. We could just flip it around for a U-shaped expectation. So plus one, negative one, negative one, and plus one again. That is a perfectly legitimate contrast to test, which is quadratic in function. Once we get up to four means, we can actually test cubic functions which implies that there are two bends in the pattern of means. I do not see this sort of thing very often in the behavioral sciences, but you can see it. It does happen, and I have seen some legitimate ones that were interesting, but less common. And in this case here, you just follow the pattern. We start low, negative one, we go high to three, and then we come down three, and then we go back up one. So it starts low, goes up, goes down really low, and then comes back up. So that sums to zero, and it represents two bends in the patterns of the means. And then finally, five means. You have the patterns here for the contrast weightings. So you don't, have, you don't have to generate these yourself. You don't have to memorize this sort of stuff. You simply have to look at a table and identify the coefficients that represent the hypothesis you have in mind. So in subsequent videos, I'm going to show you examples of doing that in SPSS, and you'll get in a sense of how this is tested and the results that you get from it.